This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Do you have any pain anywhere? Can you wiggle your toes for me? Do you know your name? Can you squeeze my hand? You'll be okay. You're in the hospital. Can you tell me your name? You still hypothermic? I see that. When I first regained consciousness, I was extremely afraid and confused. I didn't know who any of these people were. I didn't know if these people were going to hurt me, whether they were going to help me. I yeah, wanted to know who they is. were, where I was, who I was. My mind just felt like a big white sheet of paper. There was nothing name. there. Fear was probably the, the most overriding feeling, fear and confusion. I, everything just overpowered me. I'm You're in the hospital. Do you know your name? This man has amnesia. He is lost and alone. He has no idea where he's from, how old he is, or even if he has a family. Can you tell me your name? Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, we will examine this frightening and most baffling case of amnesia. Found wandering in the desert nine months ago, this young man remains frozen in a shadowy existence of not knowing who he is, with no past and no future. Perhaps you can help. We will also profile the twisted saga of Joe Maloney. Maloney lured his estranged wife into drinking a cocktail laced with poison. She died, and he has been at large for more than 20 years. Many believe that this ancient strip of linen, called the Shroud of Turin, is the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ, and that it bears a miraculous imprint of Christ's body. Skeptics claim that the shroud is the work of a masterful medieval forger. Join me for this fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. January 28, 1991, a young man was found wandering aimlessly through the desert, 30 miles from Las Vegas, Nevada. He was dressed in three layers of clothing, carried no identification, and had apparently been in the desert for at least three days. rushed to a hospital suffering from exposure and extreme dehydration. Are you having any pain anywhere? The patient was diagnosed with psychogenic amnesia, a condition caused not by physical injury, but by some traumatic emotional experience. Can you wiggle your toes for me? While the mysterious young man quickly regained his physical health, his memory remained completely and totally blocked. The hospital staff gave him the name Tyler and enrolled him in a state-funded program which provided a job and an apartment. In the past nine months, several tantalizing clues have surfaced, but Tyler is still a man without an identity. Tonight, he desperately hopes that someone watching can finally tell him who he is. Authorities in Las Vegas were baffled. They found no one reported missing who matched Tyler's description. There was no record of his fingerprints with the FBI, the Department of Defense, or the CIA. However, doctors did find two clues, evidence of hairline fractures in the knuckles of both hands and what is believed to be an old gunshot wound on his right thigh. Otherwise, it is as if Tyler never existed. Then another clue surfaced. During a conversation with a fellow patient from San Diego, California, Tyler got the eerie feeling that he once lived there but the recollections were vague and lacked any detail, 
until he underwent hypnosis. Under hypnosis, this kind of sharpened the memories that I was having, and it brought pictures to them, whereas most of my memories of the past came to me, just seemed like words coming out of my mouth, and more like I was looking at a piece of paper than I was really living the memory, and this brought life to it. I started remembering a lot about the beaches and different things around the beaches. I also remembered a lot about the military bases in San Diego. There's North Island Naval Air Station. There's a Coast Guard airfield right across from Lindbergh Field, uh, actually more like a hangar. And they have a gate that they open up and bring uh, the planes across Harbor Boulevard there. And I just really got a sense of belonging, like San Diego was the place that I needed to be. Under hypnosis, Tyler also vividly recalled flying over San Diego. He was struck by the certainty that he knew how to pilot an airplane. Tyler felt that getting behind the controls of a plane might help trigger additional memories. Accompanied by a flight instructor, he put his uncanny knowledge of flying okay, to the test. To get okay, let's try another turn, all right? Try to keep that nose level. Go ahead and watch your altimeter. Just make sure it stays about the same all the way through. Finally, complete control of the plane was given to Tyler, and he brought it in for a landing. There we go. Not bad. The instructor concluded that although a little rusty, Tyler had definitely flown before. As time passed, more intriguing clues emerged. Although Tyler cannot remember his own name, incredibly, he can single-handedly dismantle and rebuild a sophisticated race car engine. He also possesses highly developed skills in scuba diving, martial arts, and computer programming. Perhaps most intriguing of all is Tyler's detailed and intimate knowledge of the bombing mechanisms found on the Navy's A-6 attack plane. Many clues suggest that Tyler has some kind of military background, but no record of this man discovered in the desert last January has been found with the Navy or any other branch of the service. I'm really kind of at a difficult point in my life right now where I can't move ahead with myself. I can't get on with my life. I can't do anything, really. I'm almost like an illegal alien here. I, I have no identification of any, of any form now. I can't go to work because I, I'm not eligible for a social security number. I can't drive a car because I don't have a social security number or a date of birth. And I'm starting to feel more frustrated as the days go by because I really feel this needs to come to an end. I do need to find out who I am. A county psychiatrist diagnosed Tyler as a genuine victim of amnesia. Last month, this case took on added urgency when the state funding which provided his job and apartment was abruptly cut off. Then on the night of our broadcast, Tyler's search for his identity came to a poignant but unsettling conclusion. Within minutes, Tyler was reunited with his mother by phone. But as more details emerged, some began to believe that Tyler may not have lost his memory at all. That evening, Tyler gathered with friends to watch the show. Before his segment even aired in Las Vegas, a man from Boise, Idaho, called our telecenter and identified Tyler as his son. Unsolved Mysteries immediately contacted Tyler. Yes, sir. Sorry uh, it took so long, but everything that, that I was looking to cross-referenced, and we have located your family for you. You have? Yes. I have located your dad and your mother and your wife, who you've been separated from for, since February of 1990. And um, she, um, they've informed me that you also have two children. And your wife lives in Iowa, your mother lives in Iowa, and your dad lives in Idaho, okay? So I want to get- Tyler learned that his real name is Arthur Paul Beal, but he goes by Paul. He is 23 years old, and before he was stricken with amnesia, he lived in Boise, Idaho. A few minutes later, a nervous Paul Beal called the mother and stepfather he could not remember. Hello? May I speak with Mrs. Beal? This is Mrs. Beal. This is your son. How are you? You sound great. I've waited so long to hear you talk. I miss you. I'm scared. I bet you are. 
I don't oh. remember you. Huh? I don't remember you. I'll help you, Paul. I'll the emotional phone call lasted nearly 20 minutes. You be strong, okay? And I'll talk to you real soon. Okay. Okay, honey. Bye. Bye. A short time later, the case of Paul Beale, a.k.a. Tyler Doe, took a stunning and unexpected twist. What's the day of birth? I don't know. You don't know what the day of birth is? I don't. I have North Las Vegas police arrived and placed Paul under arrest for grand larceny. He was wanted by Boise police in connection with a stolen shipment of frozen food. How long have you had amnesia? Oh, nine months. How do you remember that if you got amnesia? Hi, I've come to get my son. The next night, Paul's mother, Lynn Beale, arrived from Iowa to post bail for him. <sighs> Their reunion was both emotional and awkward. Paul Beale still did not recognize his own mother. I don't remember you. You will. It'll just it's be strange fun. being with Paul and his not remembering anything about me, not knowing who I am. I just I want to push everything into his head, make him remember everything. I want to make sure I can do things to help him. I'm scared. I don't want to do something to push it back farther. I want to reinforce happy thoughts, good memories. I won't send it. Oh, I just want him to know I love him. We all love him. Nightmares. And I'm relieved that he's safe, he's alive. The reunion was tempered not only by Paul's amnesia, but by the criminal charge against him. In Boise, Paul was a salesman for a food supply company. On January 5th, 1991, he left for Las Vegas to sell a shipment of frozen food. He never returned to Boise. On January 25th, Paul surfaced with the empty truck in Boulder City, Nevada, where he was questioned but not arrested by local police. At that particular time, my impression of Mr. Beale was that he was very intelligent, very well-versed, uh, very possibly well-educated, very clean-cut, and extremely talkative. It just wasn't Paul. That isn't something he would do. He's done silly, stupid things like anybody else has made mistakes, but nothing to the degree that this was where he was actually breaking the law. I told him when he left, I says, boys are gonna get a warrant for you. You know, they're gonna do it. It's gonna be grand larceny felony. So it's just a matter of time. You better get up there and go back up there. He said, yeah, I'm going back now. I'm going right back up there and take care of the situation. It'll be fine. Three days after he was detained, Paul Beale, who came to be known as Tyler, was found wandering in the desert. Detective Bauman raises the obvious and disturbing question, is Paul Beale faking? Amnesia is easy. I don't know. Who are you? I don't know. Where are you from? I don't know. Do you know anything? I don't know. It's, it's easy. And a guy like him, he's convincing. Is this the four of you? Uh-huh. Thanksgiving. This still isn't my son in, in the fact that this isn't how he would react to me. We were very close. I could tell by his eyes when I first saw him tonight that he really didn't recognize me. He, was, he wanted to. I could see it in his face. He wanted to. If he was faking it, there was no way he could have faked that. Am not and have not throughout this entire ordeal faked anything. This is probably the most horrifying nightmare that anybody could go through, losing an identity, losing every ounce and fiber of a person's life, having it pulled away. And then nine months later, have it given back to you or have it presented to you, but you still don't, don't have it. You know, I give anything in the world to remember right now.
Next, an international fugitive is wanted for the cold-blooded poisoning of his own wife. In March of 1967, 27-year-old June Maloney of Rochester, New York, walked out on her husband, Joseph, after five years of emotional and physical abuse. Boris, what about the kids? Don't worry In an about informal agreement, June assumed custody of the couple's two young children. Joe was allowed to visit whenever he wished. June confided in me that Joe had roughed her up a couple of times. He didn't hit her, she wasn't bruised, but he wasn't above you know, this flaring Irish temper of turning bright red and uh, jumping around, hollering and yelling and looking very dangerous and perhaps grabbing hold of you and shaking you. And that's, that's pretty intimidating. So, Neil, suppose I wanted to kill a dog. <laughs> what kind of poison could I use that couldn't be traced? <laughs> Several well, weeks after June dog, moved out, no Joe Maloney paid Neil Dunkelberg oh, an unexpected sure visit. Neil, an amateur chemist, had set up a laboratory in the basement of his mother's home. Something like arsenic or cyanide. Now, the trouble is they're very difficult to calibrate. He told me that there was a dog who was continuously tipping over his garbage cans and giving him fits. And he would like to poison the dog, but he was a little, little shaky about doing this because it belonged to a policeman that lived in his neighborhood. The purest form as I have it here, or as you would get it in a chemical supply company, it would leave no trace. No trace. Joe showed interest in one particular chemical, a clear liquid it's which is protected. odorless, tasteless, well, and lethal dog. when ingested in sufficient amounts. When Joe comes in and picks my mind about something like this, immediately afterward, I would start thinking, why did he want to know that? And I, <laughs> I got cautious. I went up and I double locked the side door that led into my laboratory. And I informed the members of my family that no one was to go into my lab, to keep everybody out, and especially to keep Joe out. Josie, thank you so much. I appreciate you letting me down here like this. You're a life -saving. I don't know, Joe. I hope this is okay. Unfortunately, it didn't work. My uh, younger sister was at home I don't know, a week, two weeks later, perhaps. And Joe showed up at the house and sweet talked her into letting him into my laboratory because he had to sterilize some instruments. That's all I need. There. That's it. That's it. All done. Okay. Two weeks later, June arrived at Joe's house for their son's fifth birthday party. Joe offered June a drink, and she stayed at the party for two hours. Here you are. Oh, thank you. You know, Joey told me this was his best birthday party ever. OK? It's fine, Joe. Glad you stayed? It's a real nice party. During the time that she was at Joe's for the party, she had called up, and she was kind of like wound up different than when she left. <laughs> And I had asked her, I said, June, I said, how many drinks did you have? And she says, Wanda, I only had two. <laughs> and uh, so she went to her apartment. And a little while later, I went over to check on her. And I asked her if she wanted me to stay with her. She says, no, she said she, that was not necessary. You know, she was, didn't feel quite well, and she was going to go to bed. There's a food poisoning. The next morning. Wanda Mordenga was surprised to find Joe Maloney and a doctor Hi, in the hall outside June's apartment. Uh, is everything all, all right here? Uh, June isn't feeling too well, so I called the doctor over. She's going to be fine. I think I'll go check on her. No, I don't think that's a good idea right now, Wanda. That's perfectly fine, Mr. Maloney. I'll just be a couple minutes. And when I went in to check on June. Hi, June. She was there, and we were in the bedroom talking. And she didn't want me to leave her alone with Joe. She wanted me to stay with her. That was quite definite. She wanted me to stay with her. So I did. So what did the doctor say? He said he thought it was food poisoning, but I think it's something else. <clears throat> All of a sudden, she stopped. And it was like a, um, 
almost a, I would almost have to say a fear look in her eyes. And I looked over, and Joe was standing in the doorway. Can I get you anything, Joe? No, thank you. What are you doing? I'm just um, <clears throat> going to the bathroom to get some aspirin. Aspirin? Some I'll get you the aspirin. She no. got up and walked around a little bit, went into the bathroom, and he fouled behind her. I told you before, I don't want you here. Look, Joe, I'm just trying to help. Who wants your help? June is a friend of mine. I think I want her help. If you want to do something for me, go to the store and get me some pop. Okay. I'll get the prescription filled, too. The next day, June lapsed into a coma and was immediately hospitalized. Despite a battery of tests, doctors could find no cause for her rapid deterioration. According to Wanda Mordenga, the situation appeared hopeless. Joe Maloney seemed unruffled by his wife's condition. He offered his own explanation. Doctor. My marriage has been on the rocks for about six months now. We're separated, not living together. Lately, she's been despondent, depressed, uh, not getting along with people at work, being irritable with my son. I think there's a possibility that she might have attempted suicide here. Joe had tried to convince me that June had committed suicide. And he told me that I shouldn't talk to anybody about anything. I didn't think she would commit suicide. I really wasn't. But I was afraid that they would, you know, somehow they would make it look like that. June Maloney never regained consciousness. On June 5th, 1967, she died. An autopsy determined that June had ingested a lethal dose of the same type of chemical Joe had taken from Neil's lab. Four hours after his wife's death, Joe Maloney was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. It was, um, I, I thought she would get better, but she never did. Um, it was a shock. I, I couldn't believe that it happened, that he would do that to her. Against his attorney's advice, Maloney has to be committed to the Rochester State Mental Hospital for psychiatric evaluation. The court granted his request. Authorities were unaware that Joe Maloney had once worked at the hospital and was familiar with the layout. On September 25, 1967, less than two weeks after he was admitted, Joe Maloney escaped from the hospital and disappeared. Five years later, and more than 3,000 miles away, authorities in Dublin, Ireland, were called to investigate a burglary at the home of a Mr. Michael O'Shea. Hi. Morning, sir. I'm Constable Devaney. This is Constable McCormick. The police apparently already knew uh, Michael O'Shea. He didn't have any criminal record in Ireland. There was no allegation of, of criminal wrongdoing on his part. But um, they were looking for the burglar's prints. All the people who were in the house obviously weren't the burglar. Um, so they wanted to be able to eliminate uh, those prints from the prints taken. Do you mind if we check the mantelpiece and the desk for fingerprints? Oh, no, none at all. Do you mind if we take your own? My own? For elimination purposes. It's standard procedure. Oh, well, fine. We'll he allowed him to take his fingerprints. Well, this detective went right into his office and sent it into Interpol, and he had a hit. Investigators were stunned to discover that Michael O'Shea's fingerprints matched Joseph Maloney's. Incredibly, the twisted odyssey of Joseph Maloney was not over. He could not be arrested because Ireland and the United States had no extradition agreement. But in 1984, the Irish Parliament did pass an extradition treaty. After 18 years at large, Joseph Maloney, a.k.a. Michael O'Shea, was finally taken into custody. He was held without bail, all the while steadfastly denying that he was Joseph Maloney.
The suspect remained incarcerated for 14 months at Mount Joy Prison outside Dublin. He refused to cooperate with the authorities and did not allow himself to be photographed. Then in 1986, the Irish-American Extradition Treaty was voided because of illegal technicality. On July 24th of that year, Joseph Maloney walked out of prison and disappeared, perhaps forever. When we return, the intriguing mystery of the Shroud of Turin. Could it be the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ? The face of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. His life and death have inspired artists through the ages. But how did they know what Jesus looked like? For more than 13 centuries, depictions of Jesus have been remarkably similar to one another. Yet the Bible does not contain a single word of physical description. Many people think this piece of linen holds the key. It is called the Shroud of Turin. According to the Bible, Jesus was wrapped in fine linen after he was taken from the cross. Many believe the Shroud of Turin is the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ and that through some miracle, his image was imprinted on its threads. This is the Shroud. It is three and a half feet wide and 14 feet long. The brown marks and lines on either side of the image are the results of a fire after the fire, these triangular patches were sewn on by nuns. This Renaissance painting shows how the 14-foot-long shroud would have covered the body of Jesus, front and back. On the second half of the shroud, there is a rear image showing a man of powerful build, 5 feet 10 inches in height. The faint imprints between the scorch marks are the source of hundreds of years of controversy. When I first began to study the Shroud of Turin, I was convinced it was a crock and that it would take me probably less than two hours to put away this pious fraud. After all, anyone with an IQ of 100 or over knows that all relics by definition are frauds. But I must admit, here I am some 17 years later I who came to scoff have stayed to pray. My own personal belief is that the shroud is probably authentic. The shroud was first exhibited publicly in Lyre, France around 1355 AD in the Renaissance period. No one seemed to know where it had come from. Eventually the shroud was acquired by the Royal House of Savoy. In 1578 AD they moved it to Turin, Italy where it was rarely shown in public. In 1898, the Savoys allowed the shroud to be photographed for the first time by a man named Segunda Pia. Surprisingly, his photographic negatives showed more detail than could be seen by the naked eye. He was to write of this experience years later and would never forget that as he lifted that glass plate, he believed that he was the first person in 2,000 years to have seen the face of Jesus of Nazareth. From that point on, the Shroud of Turin became more and more an object of scientific inquiry. Dr. Robert Buckland, a forensic pathologist, has examined life-size photographic negatives of the Shroud, looking for wounds that might correspond to the crucifixion. The body shows a number of injuries on the head we see a series of blood stains around the forehead, high in the scalp, and along the posterior portion of the scalp. These are consistent with the application of a crown or a cap of thorns. On the chest area, there's a rather unique wound. It is quite consistent with a puncture-type wound made by 
an implement which entered the chest cavity and produced an outflow of both blood and water. In the region of the left wrist, there was a puncture wound, which was clearly made by some implement which passed into the tissues of the wrist and produced bleeding. The crucifixion of Jesus has traditionally been depicted with nails driven through his palms. If it is real, why would the shroud show puncture wounds through the wrists? Surprisingly, modern research has confirmed that at the time of Jesus' death, nails were, in fact, driven through the victim's wrists. Dr. Pierre Barbet, a French surgeon, long ago proved that a nail through the palm would not support the weight of the body. The Romans did enough of these, sometimes 500 a day, to be excellent uh, anatomists. And like a butcher, they knew where the bones were. They put it in the wrist, and it held the body and held it well. From the studies I've made on Roman crucifixion, I've been able to prove that the shroud is an authentic image of Roman crucifixion, whereas the medieval, this form of crucifixion was unknown. According to many, the Shroud of Turin is authentic. They hold that it somehow survived for nearly 2,000 years, that it's stained with the blood of Jesus and bears a miraculous imprint of his body. However, some scientists believe that the imprint on the shroud is more likely a masterful work in medieval French or Italian art, a painting with brush strokes so delicate they cannot be seen by the naked eye. The controversy about the shroud's origins has taken on all the earmarks of an obsession for believers and skeptics alike. In 1978, the shroud was made available to a number of scientists for the first time. Using particles lifted from the shroud with adhesive tape, biophysicist John Heller and chemist Alan Adler determined that there was blood on the cloth. Further, their analysis showed chemical composition reflecting severe torture consistent with crucifixion. Their findings, however, are not universally accepted. When I first started working on it, I expected it to be authentic, and I looked for body fluids as the way I started. But the red turned out to be red ochre, and another pigment, uh, vermilion. These are common artist pigments. There's no question in my mind that it is a painting. Many copies of the shroud were made. It was felt by pious people at that time, if you touch the copy to the original, it would give the copy extra sanctity. It's called a brandium, is the technical name. When they were touched, of course, some of that pigment ended up on the shroud. And that is what has been discovered. But it is not responsible for the image, let alone the whole body image, total front and total back. Dr. Max Fry, a renowned Swiss botanist who died in 1983, also examined tape samples. He discovered plant pollen trapped in the threads of the shroud. These microscopic organisms have hard shells that allow them to survive for thousands of years. Dr. Fry found several pollens in the shroud that were not native to Europe. In a documentary made five years before his death, Fry stated that most of the pollens came from the Middle East, including the area around Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. Oddly, some of the pollens came from the region we now know as Turkey. The presence of such a significant number of pollens from plants growing in Turkey leads me to one fundamental conclusion. At some time of its history, the shroud must have been exposed to the air in southern Turkey or the surroundings of Istanbul. If the shroud is genuine, could it have been taken to Turkey after Jesus' death and kept there for more than a thousand years? Some believe the answer lies in a centuries-old legend which originated in the Turkish city of Edessa. Around the year 33 AD, the king, Apgar, fell ill. He had heard of Jesus' power to cure and sent for him. The king was not aware that Jesus was already dead. One of his disciples arrived instead, carrying a mysterious image of the face of Christ. The king was immediately cured, and the image came to be known as the Edessa cloth. 
It was then known only as a face cloth, but there's a key word in ancient documents, tetradiplon, which means doubled in four. If you double the shroud in four, you end up with a little rectangle with a face in the middle. Many believe that the Edessa cloth was the shroud, folded and partially covered to show only the face, because grave clothes were considered untouchable. The Edessa cloth was eventually brought to Constantinople, now Istanbul. In 1204 AD, crusaders sacked the city and the cloth vanished. One hundred and fifty years later, the shroud surfaced in France. Are the ponens found by Max Fry proof that the shroud was brought to France by returning crusaders? I think it's impossible. Um, I, I'm in an awkward spot at this point because Max Fry was a friend of mine, mm. but I think that he wanted the shroud to be real so badly that uh, he found pollen grains, which I didn't find. I had another set of tapes, and I did not find the same pollens. Optical specialist Kevin Moran claims that computer studies reveal the unique qualities of the image on the shroud. When I take a normal photograph, such as this child, and I place the child under the analyzer, you can immediately see a very distorted figure. The nose, with respect to the cheek, is totally distorted. And this is because this is a reflected image. This image is made by reflected light. This is not what we see on the shroud. The shroud is a very different type of image. The image immediately comes into a three-dimensional form. The eyes and nose-mouth relationship are all clearly recognizable. The image on the shroud is so unique that it almost enters a scientific faith factor all by itself. Many people believe that the resurrection caused a burst of radiation when the body was transformed to its new existence. This burst of radiation marked the shroud in this incredible image. There simply is no way that we can duplicate this image even today, even now. And people have certainly tried. Investigative journalist Joe Nickel created this pigment on cloth facsimile of the face on the shroud. Nickel's image is very similar in appearance to the Shroud of Turin. Under the computer analyzer, it does exhibit some, but not all, of the characteristics displayed by the shroud image. This is the Joe Nichols painting. You'll note the height of the hair and the height of the forehead, the nose, cheek. These are all quite at the same height. There's no proportioning or no shading. Here's the man of the shroud. Notice particularly that the, uh, the nose is sticking above the rest of the face. See the cheeks, the proportions of the cheeks to mouth to chin area in respect to the nose are quite good. And the forehead across the forehead. Notice how the hair actually stands up a little bit, but not too much. Bolstering Moran's work, believers say the fact that no brush strokes appear on the shroud proves it is not a painting. Skeptics point out that Leonardo da Vinci's brushstrokes were often invisible. Some maintain that the shroud we know today was painted by Leonardo on commission by the Savoy family. In her diary, the last widow of the House of Savoy wrote that she believed the shroud was not authentic. In an effort to resolve the centuries-old controversy, the Vatican allowed samples to be cut from the outer edges of the shroud in 1988. Each of three universities were provided with a tiny piece of linen for carbon dating. Dr. Paul Damon at the University of Arizona headed the carbon dating team in the United States. Their findings placed the shroud's origin between 1290 and 1360 AD. With less than five minutes, we could see that it could not possibly be first century. The difference between uh, 14th century and 1st century is so great that you could see it within a few minutes in the first measurement. We made quite a few measurements 
something like 16, but that was enough. The rest of us would say we have no disagreement uh, with what they dated, but are you sure you dated the main body of the shroud, or might you have dated a patch or a reweave? My co-principal investigator, who uh, is Irish from an Irish Catholic family, and tried to be quite blasé about the whole process, looked very dejected. And I said, Doug, what's, what's wrong? And he said, I didn't think I'd be disappointed, but I'm terribly disappointed. The Vatican accepted the results of Paul Damon's carbon dating. At the same time, carbon dating tests done in Switzerland and England confirmed Damon's findings. In 1989, the Vatican issued a statement allowing that the shroud was a suitable object for meditation and veneration the statement did not dispute the carbon testing results. On August 18, 1990, the Vatican agreed to accept proposals for a new route of scientific tests on the Shroud of Turin. The proposals could possibly include new carbon dating, but perhaps scientific analysis, no matter how fascinating or controversial, misses the point of the Shroud of Turin. For true believers, further testing will make little difference. For them, the shroud has always been simply a matter of faith. Next, authorities need your help to solve the brutal murder of an elderly grandmother. The tranquil rolling hills of rural Orange County, Virginia, are less than 70 miles but a world away from the streets of Washington, D.C. This peaceful landscape is an ideal setting for families looking to escape the crime and congestion of the nation's capital. The community of Burr Hill consists of little more than a post office and a few homes. For Ethel Kidd and her husband Gilbert, the township seemed the perfect refuge from the big city they bought a plot of land in Burr Hill and in 1988 began building a retirement home. For Ethel Kidd, the move was a dream come true. Her children and grandchildren lived in the area, and at 61 years of age, much of Ethel's life centered around her family. She was a good person. She was liked by everybody. She, she liked to cook. She liked to have cookouts and picnics, and she just enjoyed life. Wednesday, April 12, 1989, brought the promise of an ordinary day in the country. The house was nearly complete, and Ethel was spending most of her time in Burr Hill. That morning, she visited her daughter, who lived less than a mile away. Ethel returned home and was seen checking her mailbox shortly after 2 p.m. There was nothing to suggest the sinister events which were about to unfold. Thursday, the next morning, my wife called her mother about 7.30, and the answering machine answered. And she said, that's funny, Mom must have left early. Either she's on the way here to have a cup of coffee. About 9.30, I rode by, and I saw the car there. Something hit me that Something's wrong if she didn't answer the phone. I saw this book, then I saw that it was a, an atlas, a map, and I just picked it up and carried it with me, or I thought maybe Ethel may have dropped it. When I opened the door, Ethel? that's when my heart came up in my throat. That's when I knew something was wrong hit me that, uh, you know, she would never leave the door unlocked. She always had the door locked, even during the day. Ethel? Ethel, are you here? Not only was there no sign of Ethel, there was no sign of burglary or foul play. Everything in the house was eerily in place, as if Ethel had been there one moment and then simply vanished the next.
With no other leads, authorities mobilized a large task force. Law enforcement officers fanned out from Ethel's home and acre by acre painstakingly searched the woods and fields. There was still no sign of Ethel Kidd. Eight days later, less than three miles from Ethel's home, a local hunter came across a shocking sight in the same area which had been thoroughly searched the previous week. It was a body of Ethel Kidd, bound to a tree in an upright position facing a logging road less than 50 feet away. Investigators determined that Ethel had been strangled. They also found evidence of sexual assault and estimated that she had been dead for around seven days. We believe we got the victim. This area had been searched by land and air. She was definitely not at that location okay. earlier in the week. The killer is extremely brazen to bring a body back to the area where it was kidnapped from and place it in a position so as it would be found, facing a road just off of a state road and just off of a logging road. Um, it's even as if he may have been taunting the police, uh, saying, catch me if you can. It seemed obvious that Ethel Kidd had been kept in storage after she was killed. Surprisingly, there were no signs of decomposition. The medical examiner stated that, in his opinion, from the evidence that he found in his examination, that she had been kept in an insect-free, climate-controlled condition, which could mean refrigeration, uh, either stationary or mobile. The authorities theorized that the body could have been kept in a refrigerated truck, an ice house, or a walk-in freezer. Other clues soon emerged. Ethel had been bound with a type of drapery cord used in hotels and hospitals, but not available to the general public. Car upholstery fibers were recovered from Ethel's clothes. But the main focus of the investigation centered on several items tucked inside the road atlas found in Ethel's front yard. These two sheets of paper from a national motel chain contain sexually suggestive messages. Investigators surmised that the notes had been used as flashcards to solicit sex along the interstate. The most chilling discovery was a handwritten list of seven items also found in the atlas. Police suspected that it was a meticulous blueprint for murder. Line two, for instance, listed clothing and accessories which may have been used for a disguise. Line three read ID, ASAP, Paper Trip Book. The authorities were aware of a book entitled The Paper Trip, which details how a person can obtain a new identity. Item four simply read, choose location. Item five was perhaps the most baffling of all. It listed the abbreviations HC, TP, and SG. The best that we can come up with would be handcuffs, tape, and either surgical gloves or stun gun. This individual is a methodical, very particular, cunning individual. He is a loner, uh, that he is a white male, probably between 35 and 45 years old, and that he has not had successful relationships with females. We have to assume that this individual does traveling and stays in motels, uh, which could be consistent with uh, an interstate trucker or a salesperson. Ethel Kidd was extremely security conscious. Authorities theorized that the assailant may have devised a clever scheme which would not alarm her. Quite possibly, he used the road atlas to create the impression that he was lost. Hi. 
excuse me. I'm lost. Can you show me where Cole Pepper is? This was a very cunning, devious, uh, planned, calculated murder. Because of leaving clues, uh, bringing the body back, just, just the way that he did everything in this case and hasn't been caught, yes, it's my opinion that he will kill again. Hopefully, if he gets put away for doing this, that it won't be done to anybody else. Because nobody deserves to be done like this. Nobody deserves to die like this. Join me next time. Perhaps you hold that crucial clue which could help solve a mystery. Thank you.